The latest word from the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction is that, quote, no amount of alcohol is safe to consume. That's prompted a re-evaluation of Canada's recommendations on consumption of alcohol and has people debating whether it's time to put warning labels on booze. Let's see what we can contribute to that conversation with, in the nation's capital, Senator Patrick Brazo, who has a bill before the Senate to amend the Food and Drugs Act to get warning labels put on alcoholic beverages. And here in our studio, Sabrina Maddow, columnist for the National Post. And Sabrina, it's good to have you back on our program. And Senator Brazo, it's been a long time. It's great to have you back as well. Let's, Thank you for having me. Let's do this here off the top here. We're going to go through these guidelines again. I know they've captured a lot of attention, but just in case... Sheldon, you want to bring this graphic up? Canada's guidelines on alcohol and health. Alcohol, the center says, is a leading preventable cause of death, disability, and social problems, including certain cancers, cardiovascular disease, liver disease, unintentional injuries, and violence. In 2017, alcohol, they say, caused 18,000 deaths in Canada. The continuum of risk associated with weekly alcohol consumption is as follows. Low for individuals who consume two standard drinks or less per week. Moderate for those who consume between three and six standard drinks per week. Increasingly high for those who consume seven standard drinks or more per week. Mandatory labeling of all alcoholic beverages with health warnings is advised so people know the health risks involved. Okay, Senator, coming to you first, you've introduced Bill S-254 in the Senate. What's it about? Well, essentially, uh, it's a bill that uh, would require uh, the alcohol industry uh, to put uh, warning labels on, on their product uh, because since 1988, uh, alcohol has been classified as a class one carcinogen, uh, just like asbestos and, and tobacco. Uh, but yet we, we don't see any warning signs on, on that product. And so, uh, you know, because of uh, my personal problems uh, several years ago, I, I started uh, doing some research and looking into um, uh, the, uh, the effects of, of alcohol. And, uh, you know, since then, I, we've worked with uh, the researchers, the Canadian researchers at the University of Victoria, who have uh, conducted this research for, 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 for many, many years. And so the, the fact that uh, alcohol causes cancer is not, is not really in question. But the fact that se only 75 percent uh, of, of or only 25 percent of Canadians are aware that uh, alcohol consumption can cause cancer. And so uh, I thought, uh, given uh, my personal history, uh, that, uh, you know, every single Canadian should be aware of this fact uh, and it'll be up to them to uh, to make more informed changes. But before they can do that, uh, we need to have clear uh, factual information on, on, on that product. Uh, just uh, in case some don't know, you have been very candid and brave in coming forward and saying alcohol almost ruined your life, uh, took you down a very dark path, and as a result, that has contributed to your understanding of what, in your judgment, is required here. Sabrina, warning labels on alcohol, do you think they're an effective way for people to rethink their use of the product? In short, no. And the reason why that is, is researchers have looked into this, whether it's at York University, University of Alberta, Harvard, and what they found is that these types of warning labels are very low value. They don't provide enough information for consumers to make a proper choice. Often consumers also tune them out. Um, there are better ways to communicate about risks in this day and age than putting warning labels on everything. Uh, when you can't communicate information, what are the labels for? To scare people. They're about spreading fear. And in public health, we know that's not a good way to operate, whether it's scaring people or stigmatizing a product or the people that consume that product. That doesn't lead to productive outcomes and it can lead to other issues as we've seen lately in the pandemic. Now, many people who advocate for labeling alcohol uh, reference cigarette warnings mm -hmm. that we put those on cigarette packages back in the 1960s. That's half a century ago. I think we know a lot more now about human behavior, psychology. We have so many more ways to educate people and spread information in um, more positive ways that we don't need to be relying on this very old school method. Senator Brezzo, you have not convinced Sabrina yet. What would you say to try to bring her over that the warning labels really just promote fear and not really information? 
Well, it's unfortunate because uh, you know I have uh, I have experience with with this, um, and it's unfortunate that we we have to have uh, you know converging uh, issues, and this shouldn't this shouldn't be uh, this shouldn't be up for debate. I mean, alcohol consumption does cause cancer. It's a class one carcinogen, and so this is not a anti-alcohol. It, it's not anti-industry. It's 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 about cancer. It's about uh, doing something preventative for for cancer, like we did with uh, with tobacco smoking, and. You know, uh, all I'll say is that I, I will respectfully disagree uh, with Ms. Maddo because uh, in, in 2018 in the Yukon, uh, there was a 30-day period where there were warning labels uh, on uh, alcohol over there. And in one month, so 30 days, uh, there was a reduction uh, in sales of 7%. And so it is not true that, that these warning labels, um, you know, don't, don't affect people because if only 25% of Canadians are aware that alcohol consumption causes cancer, well, I, I fail to see Miss um, Maddow's position and others uh, because this is all about uh, having preventable measures for cancer and fighting cancer because alcohol has existed since the beginning of day, at the beginning of time, uh, you know, and, and cancer, we haven't found a cure yet. And so like tobacco smoking, uh, we know now that alcohol is a carcinogen and we need to label it so that at least so that we can get the 25% uh, number higher uh, because consumers deserve that and it should be their right to have that information. Okay, let me put that to Sabrina, which is, I mean, some of the labeling on cigarette packages is awfully stark and grim nowadays in telling people that this is going to kill you. Mm -hmm. I mean, are, are you saying that hasn't had any influence at all on the reduction of smoking in our society? It may have had some, but you have to remember that those labeling came in with a bunch of other measures. It came in with taxes. We put um, cigarettes behind screens. There were a lot of other messages going on and um, legislation happening at the same time. So we, A, can't single out how effective those labels were. Um, in terms of educating consumers, I'm in agreement with the senator that that's important. Consumers should be educated. They should know the risks. Um, my question is, is labeling the best way to do this? Because a lot of studies have shown it simply isn't, especially since we labeled cigarettes in the 60s. We went through a period in the 80s where lots of products ended up with labels on them. And what ended up happening, what Harvard found, was what they called the wolf versus puppy syndrome. So when you label all the puppies, the consumer can no longer tell what the big bad wolf really is. And there's this confusion, they end up tuning them all out and actually trust in public health and these messages go down. So this is just simply not a good way to communicate these messages. And the message that alcohol is a carcinogen and can cause ca cancer is absolutely true. But we also need to look at absolute versus relative risk. So what we found for some of these cancers is that for example, your risk of getting the cancer in ge general might be 0.002%. Does alcohol after a certain point increase that risk by 100%? Maybe, but then you have a risk of 0.004%. And now if a consumer sees a big scary label and they go to do their own research and they find that out, guess what? Trust goes down and our ability to communicate genuine risk with people is compromised. We know that isolation and we know that um, loneliness are big factors in life expectancy right now. And, I want, and alcohol, of course, is part of what brings people together and allows them to socialize and so on. Are you making that argument here as well? well? I'm glad you brought that up because that was another thing the CCSA study did not look at is that there are positive impacts when it comes to alcohol, so socializing, mental health, and that should be promoted though obviously in a responsible sort of way. Um, I do think there needs to be more risk messaging though um, and I just hope we can do that in a way that's supported by best public health practices. Senator uh, Brezzo, have you uh, had any conversations with people in the alcohol industry and are they open to your labeling idea? Uh, actually, uh, I have uh, had none uh, to date. Um, obviously, uh, there, there are some people who, who have uh, events and receptions uh, here on the Hill uh, for parliamentarians, uh, but uh, I, don't, uh, I don't participate in those. Um, but, you know, having said that, again, I, I, it, it should be the responsibility of the alcohol industry. And since 1988, they've known it's a carcin carcinogen, a class one carcinogen, and they have done absolutely nothing about it. And so this is why it's important that people, even, even if people have differing um, views, completely differing views from, from my bill to S2.0, uh, 
254. Well, he, he, you know, we should be supporting this bill to get it before committee so that we can have the actual experts, you know, not, not just opinionated people, uh, you know, come before committee and, and, and provide the, the research and the clear research uh, before, before we go off on tangents and, and just provide our opinions. Uh, everything that, that is, is included in Bill S-254 has been done so uh, because we're, we're following research, we're following science, and we're following Canadian science. Uh, and so if, if there are going to be people out there, naysayers, and people thinking that this is a nanny state, well, it's not. Let's get this before committee and, and let's have a, a full, wholesome debate on, on the effects of alcohol in terms of cancer because Bill S-254 is only about the causal link between alcohol consumption and cancer. It doesn't touch upon all the other social impacts, uh, the legal impacts, drinking and driving, the, you know, the, the, the whole gamut of issues. It's, it's strictly cancer, alcohol and cancer. Uh, let me do a follow-up with you on this, and that is I, I wonder whether part of your difficulty is that you also need to convince provincial governments, like, for example, the government of Ontario, which realizes about two and a half billion dollars a year through the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. I mean, they've got an interest in selling as much booze as possible. Are you fighting them as well? No, I'll, I'll, you know, my, my fighting days are over, you know, since, uh, <laughs> since I lost a pretty famous boxing match. But, you know, but I'm continuing the fight. You know, I, I lost my mother in 2004 to, to lung cancer. And uh, I had promised her at the time that I would do everything that I could to, uh, to raise awareness about cancer. And this, and this is what I'm, I'm trying to do. I mean, this, this piece of legislation is not hurting anybody. Uh, it's not affecting anybody. It's not telling people what to do, what they should or should not drink, uh, you know, because the C CSA provided advice. So advice, you, you could take that advice or you could leave it. But the important thing is that every single Canadian in this country should be aware and should know, because it's a fact, that alcohol consumption can cause cancer. And as a matter of fact, it can cause as much as seven types of deadly cancers. And if only 25% of Canadians are aware of that, um, I, I think it's very shameful because we are dealing with a poison. Uh, you, you referenced your fighting days being over, and in case anybody missed the reference, that's the reference to the very famous boxing match you had with the guy who turned out to be the current Prime Minister of Canada, and we understand that you're not in the ring anymore. Okay. Sabrina, I want to ask you about the uh, piece you wrote in the National Post in which you called the study that has been referenced here fatally flawed in favor of fear-mongering. Now, besides good alliteration there, why did you come to that conclusion? Uh, because the study... Uh led with all these very scary graphics, again, about no amount of alcohol being safe, drastically reducing the alcohol guidelines, and basically telling people, if you drink, you're going to get cancer. I had people messaging me, good friends, thinking they were literally going to die because they've been having a glass of wine with dinner twice a week for the last few years. And that is not productive messaging, especially when these people find out that's not exactly true. When you dive into the full 89-page report in the CCSA, this is directly from their report, they said publicly, we've been combing through 6,000 sources. Well, okay, that means there are 6,000 sources in general. What you find out in the fine print is that only 16 of those sources were actually ultimately used because some of those 6,000 were duplicates of one another outside the scope, they were biased. So we're only working with 16 sources. And then you keep reading down these 89 pages and you find out that the CCSA themselves say they couldn't assess the risk of bias, that they say that unsurprisingly, the quality of these sources were low, and they also didn't take into account confounding factors. So when we're looking at the lifetime risk of alcohol, and we're looking at people who are probably older and who have since been diagnosed with cancer and possibly tragically passed, and we're saying, okay, these people have been drinking their whole lives, well, they were probably drinking in smoky bars. There are other lifestyle um, influences that come into effect, and because of ethics reasons, they can't do blind test trials where they say don't drink to some people and drink a lot to others. That's obviously unethical. So the reality is, we don't really know, and the problem is the messaging from the CCSA is so much more certain well, and me, so much more scary than the evidence they actually have. Let me pick up on that, because you said this is not productive messaging. Yes. What would be more productive messaging, in your view? I think we encourage more transparent conversations. So rather than coming out with these very definitive statements that maybe can be backed up and maybe not, we do public messaging campaigns. We don't just have a highlight scary thing. 
In terms of labels, that's the problem too. You end up with one line or a big scary image. I would like to see more education in schools. I would like to see PSAs that approach this message in a more in-depth sort of way. Public service announcements. Public service announcements, absolutely. And I absolutely think that we should also support more people when it comes to substance abuse and addiction and provide more supports and education in those areas. Senator, there is a, I think it's fair to say, a widely held view in society that alcohol while acknowledging the dangers, is a socially acceptable way to change your brain, if I can put it that way, whereas there are some other things in society which are not. And I wonder how much of an obstacle you see that, namely the socially acceptable nature of booze, in your mission here. Well, look, it's it's also a fact that approximately 80% of Canadians, uh, you know, drink alcohol. And again, uh, you know, we have to differ differentiate between uh, what the new guidelines uh, that that came out uh, last week, uh, and we have to look at at Bill S two five four separately, uh, because the guidelines again are, are are advice from professionals with respect to what people uh, should should be drinking. But it's advice. But Bill S two five four is simply. Uh, you know, looking at the rights of consumers, because like I said, I'm going to repeat this again, you know, only 25% of Canadians are aware that alcohol consumption can cause cancer. And, and you know, this is not reinventing the wheel. We did this with, with tobacco companies. Uh, and, and so, you know, we should be doing the same thing because it's, it's again, it's a class one carcinogen. And so I, it's unfortunate to hear uh, people defending, uh, you know, th this issue, because, you know, if I look at many, many First Nations people uh, across this country who have been, you know, uh, you know, not just fighting, but trying to survive because of generational, um, post-generational trauma and, and looking to substances and alcohol. I mean, this, you know, this type of uh, messaging that, that we're hearing from Ms. Maddow is, is certainly not helping. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, one, if one label can save a life, I think it's better than not having any labels. Wouldn't well, you agree? Well, Senator, your messaging's a bit mixed here because you were just talking about how your bill is focused on cancer and cancer only, and yet now we're hearing that it's being tied into all these other issues. And also, just it's before not. when you were speaking, I never said that. you were referencing, you did say that, and you were referencing before the CCSA report as part of your reasoning for putting this bill forward, and now you're trying to distance yourself a little bit. Well, I think you're just, you're, uh, like I said, uh, it's unfortunate that we're having a debate on this. I mean, uh, I don't see you as uh, being pro or, or fighting, uh, you know, for, against cancer, uh, unfortunately. But having said that, I, I'm not distancing myself from, from anything. I, I support, you know, obviously I support Bill S254. And there's more and more uh, people from the medical fields who are uh, lending us support because, because somebody actually provided a platform uh, for them to speak in favor of this bill because it's needed. And so I'm going to take, uh, you know, obviously I'm going to take a close look at this, but I'm going to be looking at the, you know, more and more medical people uh, supporting this rather than having, you know, reporters or journalists or, or having, uh, you know, non-experts in this field. And I'm not an expert either, uh, but, you know, this is why it's important to get this before committee so it's properly studied. And so Canadians have uh, an inside view of what the factual information out there. That's it's as simple as that. Why wouldn't anybody support that? Well, I hope you also bring in experts on public health messaging that can speak to how spreading fear and stigma is often not productive. Can I follow up on that with you, Sabrina? Uh, Canada is perceived to be a world leader when it comes to warning labels on tobacco, on cannabis. Why should alcohol get a pass? Well, there are many things that cause cancer. Bacon, processed meats, are we going to start labeling everything? Again, we run into this puppy versus wolf issue and we end up in a low information environment where consumers tune everything out. Again, we're not in disagreement that Canadians should be better informed, that they should absolutely be able to assess risk. The question is how to do that. And the reality Leo. is there is only so much public willpower and funding and so many bills that are gonna pass the Senate and shouldn't they be better focused on something that's more productive and going to be more impactful? Senator Brazo, have you got any colleagues in the Senate who are with you on this? Yes, and uh, you know we're we're uh, we're resuming uh, the winter session uh, today, and so uh, over the break uh, there were several senators who indicated that they were going to speak in favor of this bill. And and like I said, you know, I, this is not a, a fight against the industry. It's not a fight against provincial governments because all I have to do, all I have to do personally to get this bill through is, is convince a majority of senators in the Senate.
Uh, you know, that's that's all I can do. I, I can't guarantee it's, it would pass in the House of Commons. That's hypo hypothetical. But my and you know, my my job is to convince a majority of senators. And if the majority of senators uh, decide at some point that uh, this bill is, is not uh, deemed to or, you know, shouldn't be passed, uh, then we'll, we'll communicate it, that in the future. But, you know, there's work that has to be done. And uh, hopefully we're going to get this passed, get it before committee and uh, study it uh, properly uh, for the benefit of all Canadians and all Canadian consumers. Well, one thing we love on this program is a good, vigorous, yet civilized debate. And we just had that. So I'm grateful to you both, Senator Patrick Brazo and Sabrina Maddow from the National Post. My thanks to both of you for coming on to TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.